Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Christmas is a wonderful time, but can you imagine what it would be like to be up against it? Hard times. Not able to buy the kids anything, let alone Christmas presents. Um, very hard time. But it's a, a, a time that uh, yeah, an organisation like this one, which I'm about to talk on the subject of the Salvation Army, Major Paul Haitley uh, has agreed to come and have a chat with us at the dining room table. Major, how are you? I'm going very well, thank you, Jeremy. Come a little bit closer to the, come a little bit closer to the microphone. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you also. And, uh, uh, you know, to to quote the song, you know, Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. Yeah. But for some. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, some get into the spirit of it. Others find something um, unpleasant about it. Like uh, there was a a supermarket in uh, or a shopping centre in Melbourne, Werribee, and uh, they had... The Merry Christmas sign replaced, or signs, there were many of them. They took down the Merry Christmas and they put up a Merry Everything, which is, I guess, like taking the Christ out of Christmas. Well, it seems that's the attempt there. But look, I I think the principles of Christmas can transcend across all faiths, and even if you don't have a belief, where joy, Mm. love, peace... They're, they're principles that I think, you know, um, go right across and uh, are in, uh, innate yeah. in every single one of us. So um, I suppose my word for people who want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, understanding, understand what you're actually throwing out. Yes. Yeah, I know. The, um, the demands that would be made on the Salvation Army during the year would be enormous, but at this time of the year mm. they would be particularly onerous, I would imagine. Yeah, look, they, they are. And, and what we've been seeing um, uh, particularly over the last two years is the, the cost of living crisis yeah. has uh, continued to, uh, to spiral and, and is still not settled um, yet. We're, we're seeing a, a greater demand at Christmas. I think part of that, Jeremy, is because... Um, we, we haven't got to the stage yet across our community that um, where people have actually recalibrated their expectations yeah. around Christmas. Um, Christmas can be far more than uh, the material side. Um, Christmas is a great opportunity to, to stop, reflect, yeah. uh, give thanks for what we do have. And uh, for those of us who are blessed and fortunate enough to be um, in families yeah. that, that do get together um, or with friends, it's mm. a great opportunity to come together and to, to give thanks um, for what we do have and celebrate each other. Yeah. And certainly uh, for, for someone like myself who does have a faith, um, I celebrate the birth of Jesus. Is it harder and harder to raise money? I mean, I, I, if you look at the economy, they're telling us that we're driving up inflation because we're getting a haircut and going to the mm. dentist and uh, going to dinner outside at a restaurant. Um, and households have to make the money go further and further. Look, they, they, they do. And, um, <clears throat> but we're not squandering money on getting a we're, haircut. We're, we're not. Let, let's, let's turn the clock back 30 years. Yeah, I was doing that this morning. I, I, I think we can learn an awful lot we, from our parents and our grandparents ab- and how they lived. Absolutely. But the also 30 years ago, the shopping cart yeah. for all costs of living looked di- very different. Uh, I, I, I think back, um, a bit reflective at the moment, it's been 30 years since I became a Salvation Army officer. Yeah. And when I went to train to become a Salvation Army, I took an electric typewriter with me. Yes. And uh, and in those 30 years, life has transformed considerably. And so 30 years ago, we didn't have an internet bill. No. We didn't have these smartphones that you, anybody and everybody really needs to be carrying yeah. around with them yeah. today. No one had a credit to, to card. Remind. No, no, that's right. You know, the things like <coughs> lay-by, if you wanted to buy something, you put it on lay-by. Absolutely. Or, or, you, or you saved up for it. Spot on, spot on. So life is, life is very different. 
different today, yeah. and and so so therefore, <clears throat> um, how we how we actually spend our money today looks incredibly different to what we what we did back then. But when it comes time for for people um, spending at Christmas, we've recently done a survey, Jeremy, yeah. and uh, these are these are astounding statistics that I just want to share with you, where. $25 million to support Australians in need in the cost of living crisis is what we need to raise yes, this I, year. I said your, that earlier. Your, yeah. your, um, your question around fundraising, and I, and I want to come back to that in, in a moment, but 62% of Australians are more stressed about their finances this year compared to 52% yes, yes. last year, the same time last year. And Australians will be going into debt to pay for Christmas. Now, that that's a... A red flag for me, yes. and I'd certainly be saying, folks, manage your own expectations around Christmas. Do not go into unaffordable debt People in do. order to have happiness, because yeah. you're only buying happiness for the moment. Yet, you actually, if you do that, you're buying sadness into the long term. And 31 percent of people we surveyed are seeking to use a credit card to pay for the Christmas expenses this year. Some people have several credit cards and they just rattle around from one to the other. other. That's right. And and paying back the minimum only. And the only person that's actually achieving through that are are those that are lending the credit. Yes. Nobody else wins. Yep, yep. Nobody else wins in that. Is that the same survey that pointed out uh, just how many people were worried about putting food on the table for Christmas Day? Absolutely. And... When, when we when we look at that and and we're seeing that you know twenty three percent of Australians will struggle to afford enough food to eat this Christmas, mm-hmm. that's um, that's enough to give you indigestion after the Christmas turkey, isn't it? Yeah, if, um, if you're lucky when, enough to have a Christmas you, turkey, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, and I've got to say, you know, we're, we're planning Christmas at our place. Um, we'll have the family around for the first time in a number of years because we've recently moved back um, to Adelaide. But we're planning on having a barbecue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just you know, throw throw some meat, and some salads. Um, it's no use. You don't need to gorge yourself. What's really important for us is that we're going to have family around the yeah. table and we're going to have a time to, to, to reflect. And also for me this year, um, for the first time, my dad won't be at the table mm-hmm. um, having, having gone to be with God earlier in the year. So it's also an opportunity for us to reflect upon those who have left a legacy in our own lives. It yes. doesn't need to all be about the materialism. So when you left uh, Adelaide, where did you go from here? Well, I, I've, um, so but th- you virtually run the whole thing all over Australia, don't I, you? I've been, I have been almost all over Australia, Jeremy. So um, uh, 30 years ago, my wife and I um, were appointed to uh, Western Australia, to Perth, to start a Salvation Army church and community centre from scratch. Mm-hmm. From there, we returned back to Adelaide for four years um, to head up youth and children's services. Uh, we've been across to Melbourne to run a church. We've been back here in Adelaide to head up an integrated model between church and all so um, uh, responding to youth homelessness, in, it's a sad, oh, it's God, a sad yes. space to, to work in that. And, and back then we had young people under the guardianship of the minister who had an average of 30 failed foster placements um, and they were 16 years of age. You can imagine these, these kids were, oh. were smashed. Um, but well, how do you fix it? How do you, how do you help? Well, what, what we did in that situation, um, Jeremy, we actually didn't place them back in, into foster care, into families. That that wasn't working um, for for those children. They didn't flourish in that environment. So a 16-year-old, we would um, bring him into a stabilisation unit. We would get to know them. They will get to know us. And we would place them in their very own accommodation um, but with wraparound services. So our aim was to be able to tool these young people up. We believed in them. Uh, a number of these young people, they, they were very innovative um, by nature. They knew how to work around things. <clears throat> and and so in that we taught them um, how to keep a house. We taught them how to budget. We taught them how to cook. We, we, where they had uh, dropped out of any form of um, education, yeah. formal education, we either um, worked them through to get back into a form of education. Useful, practical things. Practical things. Sometimes they'd mess up and they thought we'd kick them out. And they would bring them back into the stabilisation unit and uh, we'll have them stabilised again and we'll send them back out. And they said, oh, you return, you, 
you're having me return to that. Yes, we are, but no one else would know, but we believe in you. And 94% of young people, by the time they're 18 and a half, um, moved into the broader community as functioning members of society. Who, who is harder to help, girls or boys? Uh, look, I, 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 I think it really depends on, on the individual, you know, to, to be honest. Um, sometimes uh, with, with, with a young lady, um, they'll, they'll work you over more through the emotions <clears throat> mm-hmm. and, and through the lip. And uh, young boys about that age, they're a bit more full of uh, gusto yeah. and uh, a bit, bit more of the phys- physical side. But I think the, the key is, is that you tailor make your approach. To, to each individual. You don't, you don't have a cookie-cutter approach. No, one size does not fit all. It doesn't. No, no. no that, that's right. And, and so from, from there, Jeremy, I, um, I was appointed uh, to head up the, uh, the Salvation Army um, from, a, from a national perspective for our public relations, our fundraising, our brand and marketing, our, our media approach. It's a wonderful, wonderful brand, you know. It's I a mean, strong it's brand. Very strong brand. And, and, and can I say that we don't take that for granted? No. Um, we're so appreciative of, of Australians who do believe in the Salvation Army, believe in the work of the Salvation Army. And uh, we've recently rebranded our tagline as Believe in Good. And I think that's something Believe that, in Good. Believe in Good. Yeah. That it's something that resonates with, with, all, with all Australians. We, because fundamentally one of the values of Australians is a fair go, yeah. a fair go for all. And when, when there's fairness... When there is fairness, that is good. This idea of uh, uh, somebody once described you as Christianity with its sleeves rolled up Mm. and uh, we would find a Salvation Army officer uh, in all sorts of places where you would not really expect people to think they could go safely. Yes. But there is such respect for that uniform, isn't there? Well, I think the uniform actually says to the general public, I'm available. Yeah. And, and and there's been times whereby I've had a phone call from someone saying, look, down the beach there's a guy that's looking a bit ragged. You know, I think he needs a, a hand. I, I went down to that beach and I, I found a fellow that could not negotiate taking the cork out of the wine bottle. Mm-hmm. So instead he smashed the top of the, the neck of the wine bottle mm-hmm. and was drinking out of jagged glass. And, and I, I sat down with him. We had this conversation. Life had gone uh, pear-shaped for him. <clears throat> and I said, "You need some help, mate. Let let us let us get you some help." And I put him on my car, and we drove him to a, a sobering up unit. And on the way, he said to me, "He said, he said, Paul, I didn't really believe in God, but I prayed in my desperation. I prayed that Lord send someone to me today to help me. And if you don't, then I'll just walk out into the ocean. I'll keep walking." Mm. And and then I had this phone call, I roll up and and we were able to get this guy into, into great care. Three months later I had the, the need to actually go to our drug and alcohol um, rehabilitation centre and I see this guy building wall. I actually didn't recognise him. He recognised me because he looked so good. You know, like he physically he was recovering and had really recovered you know, and he was in recovery and probably will be for the rest of, of his days because once addiction takes hold of somebody, yep. it's always there. You're one drink you're, away. You're one drink away from the bust. Mm. You, you, the other thing about the Salvation Army is that you, you, you are not judgmental. You know, a lot of people think that uh, Christianity as such is very judgmental, but not the Salvation Army. Well, we believe, Jeremy, that there's a backstory behind every situation. Yeah. You know, when I um, when I was wandering through the city one day, and uh, I sat down next to uh, a fellow that's sleeping rough. Yeah. Um, it was early in the evening. He had his cardboard laid out um, for um, what he considered to be a comfortable night's sleep, yeah. and and I started chatting to him. And one of the things he said to me he said, "Paul, I was homeless before I was houseless." Mm-hmm. I was homeless before I was houseless. Now, what he was meaning by that was that you don't just end up on the street overnight, but life starts to deteriorate. And, and you know, for some of us, you know, who are in difficult circumstances, living in, in homes, um, what, what are the hallmarks of home? It's actually that's your safe place. Yeah. 
that it's where people love each other. It's where people um, actually don't inflict violence upon each other. Shouldn't. 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 And, and I think that's the difference between a home and a house. Yeah. And so what this fellow was saying was I still had a roof over my head but everything that actually created this safe place for me mm. that, that was equilibrium for my life was disappearing and he ended up on the streets. So there is, there's a backstory behind um, everybody's circumstance and I think that we would be best served if we actually save the judgment to God yeah. and, and, and actually just yeah, yeah, yeah. got under yeah. the skin of people yeah. and understood what led them towards those circumstances. Do you, do you remember a song called uh, There But For Fortune? Yes. Bob Dylan's song and I think it was, uh, I don't know who sang it, Folk singer, nearly had a name. But there, uh, see the drunkard as he stumbles out the door, see the something, something, uh, there but for fortune go you and I. That's right. Very, very true. Very Absolutely. True. Because, you know, we we don't choose the family. Joan we're Baez. Born. Jo- yes. Joan Baez, <clears throat> yeah. We don't choose the family we're born to. Mm. We don't choose into the circumstances in which we're born to. Mm. And... Sometimes things happen to us in life that are completely beyond our control. Sometimes they're completely within our control. Mm. And there are consequences. Yeah, there are consequences always. to, our, to yeah. our decisions, whether it be good, indifferent sure. or bad. There are certain <coughs> laws, aren't there? I yeah. mean, the gravity, if you jump off the roof, you will fall at 32 feet per second till you hit the ground. A- a- consequences. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but I've met with some young people and I've looked at them and I've thought, you were trouble, you, you, sorry, you they weren't trouble. They were in trouble yeah. even when they were in the womb. How do you mean that? Oh, because well, like, of their environment. Because, because of the environment. They were being born Absolutely. into trouble. That, that, born that's into right. trouble. You know, they, they may have had a mum that was, you know, shooting cocaine into their veins whilst, uh, whilst the baby was in the womb, um, you know, even, e- even uh, drinking alcohol. Oh, um, yes, yes. You know, smoking. It, it's well documented today, yeah. you know, through, through research. Fetal that, alcohol that, that, that syndrome. Can, that, that can do bad things to, to an unborn baby. What do you think about uh, governments and uh, local governments that, uh, uh, set up what they call they call safe injecting rooms. Mm, yeah. So this is, this is a journey that we've been on within the Salvation Army because, as you're going to understand, we're an abstinence organisation, mm. and um, and we're actually uh, it may come of shock to you, Jeremy, but in Melbourne, in uh, Burke Street, um, at the moment we're looking at actually not running it but hosting a safe injecting room. And, Are you really? And, and, and in amongst that, some of our, our onward um, formation and thinking here is that whilst we can keep someone alive, yeah. there is a chance for life transformation. But is there such a thing as a safe injecting room? <clears throat> well, in, in the respects they're not overdosing. Uh, look, at, at my, my, my advice to anybody who's thinking about drugs don't try them in the first place. No, but there is a and, consequence. <clears throat> I mean, if you do go in harm's way, you can expect trouble. A- absolutely. But we've also seen many people that have been addicted to hard drugs actually yeah. break the cycle. So so whilst there is this safe injecting room mm. and that we are keeping people alive, there's an opportunity to build that relationship, that trust. And actually h- take how them how on can you do it without making it look like it's okay well, to put... A needle in your arm. That, that is one of those scenarios. And, and I think one of the clear things we want to say is we don't condone yeah. drug use. Um, for, for some of these people that are really struggling with it, um, uh, harm minimisation mm. is, is a very real um, way of, uh, of, of a rehabilitation process. And sometimes so, some folk just can't go the, the, the cold turkey. Uh, they've, they've got to reduce as well, time it, goes on. In Canberra, uh, thanks, I suspect, to the Greens, they, they have a policy where you can have a personal amount That's right. of methamphetamine, uh, heroin, cocaine, mm. marijuana. Uh, what, what would you think of a law or a community that would allow that? Uh, I it's think, a very mixed message yes, you're sending and, to kids. And, and Jeremy, I've, I've recently moved back from Canberra, actually having been the head of government relations for, for uh-huh, the Salvation uh-huh. Army, and, and we, were, we were wrestling with this, with this very topic. And <clears throat> there, there does come a time whereby we can look at it from a punitive level or we can look at it from a health response. Mm. And, <clears throat> and uh, can I say the federal police were, were 
absolutely dead against this. I can understand this, that, uh, yeah. Uh, this, this process here. <clears throat> and uh, we would prefer that people didn't use yeah. um, at all in the first place. I'm not sure if someone is using by actually giving them a conviction is actually the answer. We've, we've got to address this from a, from a health perspective yes. and, uh, and, and particularly – and look, some of the measures, I don't think they got some of the measures right, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, some of those uh, measures were enough for someone to actually die of, of an overdose. That's, that's not a good law. No. But, uh, but I think if there was that aspect of being able to carry on them uh, a particular amount for them to use recreationally, that actually would not bring them into overdose yeah. whilst – Again, connecting with these people and and actually working through um, from a health perspective. Yeah, but if a little is that, nice, uh, a, a, a <clears throat> lot may be a lot more and, nice. And, 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 and for some, they do get down yeah, that yeah, path. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, um, from an abstinence point of view, that's where we'd prefer to start. Okay. Uh, what about this idea that uh, kids who go to a, a rave or a, a schoolies or something else, they're going to have uh, pill yeah, testing, testing, pill testing? Testing. Now, that, that uh, if I was a, a kid growing up and I was sort of given that sort of safety net, now it's okay, but just make sure you get your pills tested. tested. Uh, you, you can't. I can't see how you can send that message out there. Look, it's a, it's a tough one, isn't it? And, and again, <clears throat> um, I, I believe the pill testing actually does save lives, but... We, we got it. That's that's just dealing with with the behaviour. Yeah. It's actually not dealing with the antecedent. And 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 I think too much in life, Jeremy. We we look at we look at the behaviour yeah. and we and, and we deal with it with a consequence. Get behind the antecedent, the trigger, mm-hmm. and start actually working with the trigger. Mm-hmm. Then some of these behaviours actually do solve themselves. And, and I've got to say, I'm so glad I, I, I grew up in a in, in an Adelaide where drugs weren't being peddled yeah. at every street corner. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, you know, marijuana was just starting to, to come into, into vogue, um, but uh, I wouldn't yeah. have known where to find it. To have you ever had you. a drink? I, I have. Um, I've tried it. I've never got drunk. Um, and uh, that was in my teenage years. And, and I think having grown up in the Salvation Army, there does come a time for all of us where we actually disown our mums and dads' values and we discover <laughs> our own, yeah. don't we? <clears throat> and and well, that's important kids to experiment. do that. They do. <clears throat> and I've got to say it's really important that we actually find, our, whether it be our own faith or our own values. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not embedded in us. It's actually more of a, a head knowledge than a heart knowledge, yeah. and out of our heart actually drives our drives our behaviours, and and so when you see a young person going through this, it's actually we shouldn't see it as a crisis, but an opportunity to come alongside them and mentor them yeah. and help them actually find them in the world. Does the Salvation Army still? And I, I'm I'm I've seen not lately, mind you, but I've seen on many occasions. If I happen to be in a hotel or something like that, uh, a Salvation Army, uh, usually a, a lady mm. with the bonnet. Do they still wear the bonnet? No, the, the bonnets have gone, but it's, it's an interesting. But just I do a, remember the bonnet. A, a, a little bit of history about the bonnet. The reason why we actually adopted bonnets in the first place is because in the early days of the Salvation Army, we came under a great deal of ridicule. We weren't as loved as what we are today, and the bonnets were actually a protective headwear for, for the rocks and the, really? the bricks were, that were being thrown at people. <laughs> You're kidding. And, no, that's the truth <laughs> of the matter. <clears throat> and uh, we, we, don't, we don't wear the headwear like we used today because back then it was also fashionable yes. um, a statement as well. But a lady would come into the fr- right. fr- a front bar that's right. and be treated with respect. Absolutely. And she would have a, a, a tin. That's right. And she, does that still happen? It, it doesn't happen as much as it used to. When I was what they called a core officer, uh, the minister of the church, I used to always go out and do the pubs myself and, yeah. uh, and, and we would walk around, um, you know, we're everywhere. And, and we, we wouldn't just go in there um, uninvited. We would actually approach the publican in the first place and say, would you mind? So um, there's some places that say we don't want you in there, we respect that, but we'd go around and, and it, it was more than, than rattling the tin. What we actually found that it was very much um, speaking to people's lives, it was like a chaplaincy service and because um, everyone wants to find community, everyone wants yeah. to find a place of belonging and 
And for some, they go to the pub on a Friday night and they just have a few beers with their mates and, and they have a good time and they go home. But for others, they're actually there every night of the week yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. where they've found their community. But that amount of consumption of alcohol um, isn't actually healthy for them and they're not connecting with the wider spheres of community that can mm. be really supportive of them. The Salvation Army, I guess, is, uh, and particularly at a time of the year like this, apart from being very busy, uh, how many officers do you have? Because it's a global organisation, isn't it? It is a global organisation. So, so look, in Aust- across Australia we have 700 officers. Men and women. A men and women. Um, some married, like my wife is a Salvation Army officer and we join together in yes. this ministry. Some spouses aren't. Others are, are, are single people. And uh, in, um, in South Australia... Um, and Northern Territory, because I'm um, also responsible for Northern Territory. We have 70 officers, um, but we also have um, uh, over uh, 300 um, employees and uh, we have about 3,000 volunteers. So volunteers are absolutely essential uh, to, to the work that, and, that and we the do. Money, and the money you raise, and this is part of the reason that I, and I'm sure a lot of other people, respect the Salvation Army so much, you, unlike a charity where you've got uh, overheads, yes. admi- administration, I think they call mm, it. That's right. Uh, when you give to the Salvation Army, it goes to the cause. Yes. There's nothing taken out. It all goes to the cause yeah. for which you're collecting it. And, and look, so there, there are we, we, our, our administration costs we try to keep as low as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when you've got a workforce of 10,000 people across this nation, we do need to have a HR department. Uh, that would be oh, yes, as, yes, yes. As, as administration. Uh, when, you, when you're doing a, a campaign on, on the TV and the radio, you do get some of that space gifted, but you do need to pay for others. Yeah. So we, um, uh, we hover between 87% to 93% of money that no, is that's raised, wonderful. goes directly to the to the oh. cause um and uh, <clears throat> uh fundraising institute of australia um i think they sit around that um 30 percent to administration sort of mark so we're well within well within those uh those hallmarks there but what we what we need to be is uh is very good stewards um i've just uh, flown in from melbourne overnight where I've been in, in finance uh, meetings around budgets for next year. And the one thing that, we, that we're absolutely clear about within the Salvation Army is that we release as much as we possibly can to the front line for those that are in need um, for us to be able to help. Uh, we are not, uh, whilst we, we have a $1.3 billion turnover a year across wow. Australia, um, uh, we, we're not about hoarding um, large amounts of, of but I'll money. bet people leave money to you in their will. They do, they do, and and we're very very grateful for that, because whilst their life has ended on this earth, the legacy that they give um, can can transform mm. many other lives. And uh, would you believe that around about half of our donated money yeah. comes through our bequest program? Yes. Really important. Oh, no, I can believe that. And a lot of people, um, uh, uh, Kerry Packer comes to mind, uh, and I think Dick Smith, a lot of people very quietly give money to they the do. Salvation Army. They, they do. We, we rarely have somebody give to us and want public acknowledgement. No. Now, now, we, we want to we honour yeah. um, those people as well, but we also are mindful that when people gift money to us, they also lend us their reputation. Because when when someone's been very generous, and if we do something that will actually bring embarrassment yeah. to to that person, yeah. um, that's not what we're. I've about. I've never heard uh, anyone say a bad word about the the Salvation Army. Do you ever ever have any trouble? I mean, do you ever cashier anybody or sack them or <laughs> sideline them? Or we do. You yeah, do. I, I, absolutely. <laughs> You know, we, I can't we, imagine it. No, look, there, there are times, you know, people are people, aren't they? And there are times whereby um, Salvation Army officers, staff, volunteers don't meet our expectations. Mm. Now, um, it would need to be severe for us to sack them on the spot. Sometimes we've had to. Uh, we, we would move them through, you know, mentoring, counselling, mm. uh, performance management. Uh, but... At the end of the day, we do have an expectation that people do 
live out our values in the way that they live out their oh, life. It's only fair. Yeah. Particularly in the workplace, but equally on social media. If they've identified that um, they work for the Salvation Army and they put something up on social media that brings us embarrassment, we'll ask them to take it down. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, Do you still have people joining? Uh, I don't know whether you go out and recruit. <laughs> yeah, or... yes. So um, really the, the, the church overall in the developed world has been in decline since probably the mid-80s, to be honest with you. And, and uh, we, we still are seeing people, people come in. But it was interesting. Uh, recently I, I was speaking with um, Assistant Minister for Charities, Andrew Lee, in Canberra. Yeah. And, and he was saying, Paul, ha, you know, since the mid-80s, church has been in decline, trade unions have been in decline, service clubs have been in decline. And, and he was saying, I, I just, I just wonder, wonder what what happened there. <clears throat> and and as I look back, what happened in the mid mid eighties? Well, when I was in high school, um, in Adelaide here, twelve o'clock on a Saturday, life stopped for a day and a half. <laughs> yeah, trading ceased, yeah. <clears throat> and. And so Saturday was fun. Saturday afternoon was fundamentally that the time which we actually went for um, uh, for sports, yeah. <clears throat> or you know went down the beach or whatever we did. Yeah. Sunday, whether people went to church or whether that was family day, uh, there wasn't the shops or the cinemas open in the no, lives. No, no. So when we actually went with, uh, I won't call it deregulation, but a change of the regulations of trading hours and people's peripheral time actually was squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, mm. then things like service clubs, um, institutions, churches started to, to decline. But can I say we start to see the green shoots again yes. in, uh, in people understanding that, you know, their, their makeup is of the physical, the emotional, the psychological and the spiritual. And if we don't actually give ourselves over for nurturing of the spiritual... Yep, yep. Then there's a piece missing in our life. Do you do you guys still go to war zones? Because in, in various theatres of war over we the do. years, you <clears throat> I, uh, there are some incredibly moving pictures of what. Absolutely, yes, and you we don't do. go into a war zone with a gun, do you? No, no. Look, we we don't. We actually uh, go there for the well-being of those that are serving, um, serving our country. At, at this point in time, we actually do have somebody that um, from Australia that's uh, headed across um, to do some work in the Ukraine at mm. this point in time. Yeah. Well, bless you, sir. Thank you. And have a, have a wonderful Christmas and thank you for the fantastic work that you do, Major. Thank you so much. And I do uh, wish everybody else a very happy, holy and sacred Christmas. Thank you. God bless you. Indeed. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.